All right, let's open our Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6. We're going to look at the last eight verses today, verses 13 through 20. But before we do, look at verse 12 once again. They be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Comparing Scripture with Scripture, we notice that the phrase through faith and patience clearly means by faith and works. Faith is faith, but the word patience is defined for us in Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There can be no mistake, God's speaking of a time in which both faith and good works, or keeping the commandments as it is, will be required. Um, this is largely why I say that the book of Hebrews is aimed at Jews, it's called Hebrews after all, who are left behind following the rapture of the church uh, when the reign of the Antichrist then uh, commences. Verse 12 says that through faith and works, or patience, some inherit the promises. And then the immediate example Paul gives to illustrate this is the case of Abraham. Verse 13, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. And then verse 15, and so after he, as Abraham, had patiently, there's that word, endured, he obtained the promise. Look forward just a few pages to James chapter 2. James 2, notice verses 21 and 22. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? But look back, if you will, at Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13. Genesis 13, and begin with verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after the lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abraham, excuse me, then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Also notice chapter 15. And... Uh, Verses 5 through 7. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of, the, out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Jump down to verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. God promised him all the land from the Nile River in Egypt westward, all the way over to the Euphrates River in the east. 
and dominion over all the peoples who dwelled within that territory of the earth. Uh, the descendants of the Hittites and the Jebusites and all the rest would one day be servants and subordinate to the descendants of Abraham, is what God promised to him. But let me ask, have those promises uh, been realized yet? No. Of course not. Go back, if you will, to Isaiah 43, just for a moment. Isaiah 43. <laughs> Isaiah 43. And look at verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> Isaiah 43, verses 9 and 10. Let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say it is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. God says, ye are my witnesses, verse 10, and my servant, verse 10, he's speaking to both uh, uh, Jacob or Israel, as he refers to them by both names, verse 1. He's talking to the nation of Israel, all the tribes collectively. So he uses a singular, my servant. And he says, ye are my witnesses, verse 10, and uh, to testify before me there was no God for me, neither shall there be after me. Verse 9 says, let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled. You know, the United Nations General Assembly have passed more resolutions condemning the state of Israel for their protection of their own land. That God allowed them to do one noble and good thing after World War II, when, the world, when pressure from the whole world was upon them to get involved and resolve this, or the League of Nations as they were first known. And they established the modern state of Israel. And Israel uh, became a, a state in 1948. And for the last uh, what, 70, 70 years now, um, that the modern state of Israel has existed. But since that time, Israel has sought to protect the land that they have and defend the land that they have against Muslim nations all around them who despise them, are jealous of them, envious of them, envious of their prosperity and success, and want to destroy them. Um, but God has protected them. And God says there in verse 10 of Isaiah 43, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand, notice, that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. The witness of God's existence is the continuous existence of the Jew. There's no other way to, to understand that verse. The witness that the, the Lord God of the Bible must exist is by the fact that the Jew still exists. And when nations around the world and nations and, and Christian denominations have sought to undermine the place of the Jew in the scriptures, or in the mind of God, in the will of God, by saying all the promises of blessing uh, are no longer the property of the Jew. They now belong to the Christian who has received Jesus Christ as his Savior. They try to spiritualize all the physical blessings and promises to that uh, race of people, the descendants of Abraham, and those who embrace the same uh, God of faith uh, that Abraham had in God, and say all of those things now belong to the New Testament Christian that God has all finished blessing or prospering the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham. If that were so, uh, given the fact that so many forces and elements in the world have wanted to destroy the existence of the Jew, there shouldn't be any Jews left. Uh, think of a, a, a nation of people or, or a race of people that were driven from their homeland in 70 A.D., 
and scattered abroad, scattered as far as they could go in all four directions, north, south, east, west, uh, as far away as China and India and Japan. There are Jews there, people who identify themselves as Jews. Now, you look at them, they might not look, we have a certain stereotype that we think a Jew is supposed to look like, uh, but they may not look that way because of, of some intermarriage over the centuries. Uh, likewise, uh, people in the north of Israel and Russia, uh, down in Africa, and uh, uh, westward in throughout Europe, and by extension, you, North America and down in South America. Uh, but we have a certain stereotype of what we think Jewish people are supposed to look like, only because we see Jews and they may have some sort of common character characteristics or traits in New York or Brooklyn or or Philadelphia, places of that, uh, like those cities, but uh, not absolutely so, um, because, of, like I say, because of uh, intermarriage and the dilution of uh, genes and genetics, but they still understand that they are descended from Abraham. They're part of the 12 tribes. They might not know which tribe their ancestors are part of. God knows, however, and uh, their identity has been preserved. Not only has their identity been preserved, their language has been preserved. They have no country of your own, scattered from pillar to post, uh, in every country of the world, and yet preserve the same language of your people that God revealed to the prophets uh, a thousand years before Christ. That language still exists. And they're speaking Old Testament Hebrew in Israel today. That's another miracle. Um, so that not only the Jewish people exist, but their language exists and so Christians who say that God is all finished with the Jew and all the blessings of God have been transferred to the believer in the New Testament is an idiot. Amen. Someone who says that is a moron. Amen. You're, you're, you're ignoring the obvious facts right before your face. There's a doofus over there in Tempe, Arizona named Stephen Anderson. He called himself an independent uh, King James only uh, Baptist preacher and he's a vicious anti-Semite. He, put out a, he produced a whole video, a whole movie, called Marching to Zion, and it was all an attempt to expose the Jews as frauds and, uh, and to undermine the authority of uh, the identity of the Jewish people in the world today, uh, calling into question how many people were actually murdered in the Holocaust and all those anti-Semite um, uh, uh, slurs and remarks. All of that's contained in his video. He went to interview rabbis in their homes. He got his way into their home with his camera to interview them about their faith and beliefs and then use their interviews uh, in a way to um, attack them and say that they don't know God, they don't know Jesus Christ, they're holding on to some ancient religion and ancient hope that, no, that they have no more claim to. And that guy needs to be exposed as the anti-Semite he is. And uh, if we, through our website, of Gene Ha, I know he's he tried to do that quite a bit. Um, but he needs to be exposed as an anti-Semite. And the Jewish Defamation League needs to go out and protest outside his church or do what they can to uh, discredit that guy wherever they can. He's a buffoon. He's, uh, he's unskilled in the word of God. And they say, well, he quotes a lot of scripture. The devil knows more scripture than he does. Mm -hmm. The devil can quote more scripture than any Christian in the world. Yep. That means nothing. The amount of scripture you can quote or you have committed to memory. If you're twisting it and saying God's all finished with Israel uh, and yet Jews still exist. If God made promises to Abraham and uh, all of those promises have not been realized yet and the Jews still exist, what do you make of it except that God still intends to fulfill those promises? Amen. But... So, in our, in the truth of the matter is, however, <clears throat> after Abraham endured, notice verse 15, back in Hebrews 6, let me go back there too. Verse 15, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Um, after Abraham endured, the only promise he received was that God blessed him, and he multiplied his seed. Um, look forward at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. 
I had some jerk watch my sermon or my uh, Bible study last week and posted a comment under it on YouTube. Why are you preaching out of the book of Hebrews when uh, Gene Kim says uh, the book of Hebrews is aimed at the Jews, not the church? And uh, I've seen this guy. He's posted other stuff up there. He's a, I don't know if he's a Seventh-day Adventist. He's an idiot, whatever denomination he is, uh, claiming that we have to worship only on the Sabbath day. To worship on any other day, uh, you have taken essentially taken the mark of the beast. That's what the Adventist church used to preach, that if you worship on Sunday or you set aside Sunday as your day of rest, the day you gather, you've effectively taken the mark of the beast. No, you're, you're following the pattern laid out in the New Testament, where believers gather on the first day of the week, you dumb jerk. <laughs> but um, look at Hebrews 11, and verses 12 and 13. Um, speaking of Abraham, therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead. Remember, Abraham was so old, his body withered away. Uh, there's a great word for that called wizened. Wizened means uh, dried up and shriveled up through old age. Um, Abraham was wizened in that respect. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So the rest of the promises to him will not be realized until after the second coming of Christ. Uh, also, while you're there in Hebrews 11... Hebrews 11, uh, notice there verses 39 and 40. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. They had promises and they had faith, but they didn't have Jesus Christ yet. And that's what they needed. They needed faith in Christ to make their faith in God perfect. Now, let's read the section for our lesson today. Let's go back and read verses 13 through 20 all together. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them, and end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the, heir, unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, of which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The writer of this uh, book touches on the subject of a priesthood and a, a mediator. So he says of God, verse 13, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Uh, there is no one greater than God. So God can't say, you know, I swear by, by such and such or something of greater value than God. There is nothing greater than God. <laughs> and uh, verses 14 and 15, we've <coughs> commented on already. Verse 16 says, For men verily swear by the greater. Hence, the most, one of the most common cuss words for Roman, unsaved Roman Catholics is Jesus Christ. Or they'll throw in the, the uh, Holy Family, Jesus, Joseph, Mary. Or Jesus, Mary, Joseph. Somehow they think that um, is cute, or that, that, that won't be taken seriously. But, um, and uh, the words God damn is to, supposed to have more force when you add the word God to the word damn. 
because there's power with God. Nobody says, by Buddha, I swear this or that. Nobody says, Muhammad, get that Muhammad damned thing out of here. <laughs> Nobody talks that way. Because Buddha and Muhammad have no power. There's no authority behind them. And everybody universally seems to know that by instinct. So they don't invoke those names when they want to curse and swear because those names mean nothing. And down inside, they know they mean nothing. But when they want to swear and curse, they'll use the name of God, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a curse and swear word without hesitation. And, um, but there's no power in those names. Then verse 16 says, And an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. At least it was supposed to be. Go back to Exodus 22. Exodus 22. And I know I'll have you jump around and look at other scriptures quite a bit. That's the way you're supposed to do it. <laughs> Listen to these Calvary Chapel ministers. <clears throat> They'll read part of the verse, and then they just go launch off into some sort of a uh, ad lib, um, extemporaneous speech about you know feel good examples, feel good illustrations and spiritualize everything, and they never compare scripture with scripture to help you understand what the Bible's telling you, what the Bible's describing. And then they move on to another verse and do the same thing. And uh, we spent, I think we started in mid-January of 2018 studying the book of Ezra. And we just finished uh, the book of Ezra the last time we met on Wednesday evenings. And so almost a full year, maybe 11 months, we spent um, in the book of Ezra. And uh, coming uh, next year, we're going to begin, move into the book of Nehemiah. But I heard these guys on the radio saying, you know, we're in, a, we're in an in-depth, verse-by-verse study of the book of 2 Corinthians. And the guy goes through all, all the chapters of 2 Corinthians about four weeks, and they think they've really been fed and taught the Word of God in depth. You haven't learned anything. We spent three years going through the book of Psalms. These people that uh, think they're going to study the entire book of Psalms and get through it in uh, oh, about a month and a half, two months, and they'll, they'll, they'll bite off and say they've covered one chapter, two chapters in a half hour Bible study class. You've learned nothing. You glean nothing. You don't see Christ on the pages. You don't see the glimpse of the second coming and the second advent. You don't see Christ depicted in the person of David or uh, the man of sin depicted in David's enemies and so forth. All, none of that. All that seems to be lost. But uh, look at Exodus 22, verse 11. Well, verse 10. If a man deliver under his neighbor an ass or an ox or sheep or any beast to keep, and it die, or be hurt, or driven away, no man seeing it, then shall an oath of the Lord be between them both, that he hath not put his hand unto his neighbor's goods, and the owner of it shall accept thereof, and he shall not make it good. That is, if a guy swears by his own honor before God that he didn't do anything to damage that livestock or to damage those goods, that other person, that it's a damage or it's harm or it's death was out of his control, he had nothing to do with it. That you're supposed to take his word that he's telling you the absolute truth. And the guy who, who's the injured party is supposed to accept it. The absolute truth is to be required of both men. Now, um, today, American, uh, a witness in an American courtroom he might be sworn in to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help him God. But uh, don't expect uh, truth. You, you expect deception. In fact, just about in every walk of life, you expect people to lie to you. They're, everything's a scam these days. You know, buy this, this product. This product will cure your problem. You, you've got arthritis. This product will cure arthritis. This problem will cure your insomnia. This problem, you know, 
And then side effects may include diarrhea, vomiting, you know, excessive sweat, uh, incontinence, and all kinds of other things. You know, the, the side effects are worse than the disease it's supposed to cure. And our microphone is buzzing in and out, um, so we're going to break it and get rid of it and get a new one next Sunday, hopefully. <laughs> but break it. But uh, as an American uh, a witness, rather than an American courtroom, uh, doesn't if he puts his hand on the Bible, I don't know how many courtrooms still use a, even a Bible to swear the witness in. Put your hand on the Bible, raise your other hand, and solemnly swear to tell the truth. Because by and large, Americans don't believe the Bible anymore. So you can't expect them to tell the truth uh, based upon the, the authority of a book they don't even believe. They don't read it. That's one thing we know for sure. Whether they believe it, uh, that's another thing. But the honesty and truthfulness, uh, that's out the window. Don't expect it. Don't look for it. Because you won't find it in very many places. But uh, verse 17, back in our text. Verse 17, let's read that. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability, excuse me, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. The heirs of promise, that plainly reaches uh, in two directions. Those who would receive Jesus Christ by faith, in fact, run back to Galatians chapter 3, real quickly. Galatians 3. Galatians 3 and verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So, you and I are heirs of that promise, uh, but also uh, a promise to the literal, physical descendants of Abraham, who will inherit the land of Palestine, as mentioned in Genesis 15, which we, we spoke of just a little bit ago. Most preachers limit the promise to the first category, spiritual promises to New Testament believers, and they ignore the second category of literal fulfillment to the descendants of Abraham, because they've never been taught it. They could learn it, but maybe they're just too afraid to approach it, or to approach that subject. They're, they've never been taught to study or rightly divide the word of truth. There's more than one application of, of each verse in the Bible. Uh, you draw, we draw spiritual blessing and devotional benefit from it. If it's uh, targeted and aimed at a Jew, literally, in the Old Testament or in the coming tribulation, if it's aimed at a Jew, then all you and I can do is apply it spiritually and see how that helps us devotionally and draw closer to Christ or help us uh, in our uh, yieldedness or obedience to Christ more fully. But uh, it's literally intended for someone else. And... Uh, Verse 17 also, the immutability of his counsel. If a thing is immutable, then it's unchangeable. It's fixed. And the land grant given to Abraham and his seed uh, will indeed be fulfilled. Uh, look at Romans chapter 4. Romans 4. And verses 12 and 13, speaking of Abraham, verse 12, and the father of circumcision, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. God blessed Abraham and promised things to him because of his faith long before he was ever circumcised. And that's how the Jews would identify themselves by the circumcision of the, of the males. But before that was ever uh, implemented or commanded, God promised to bless Abraham and his descendants because of Abraham's faith. Verse 13, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The... Um, when God made his promises to Abraham, there was no Mosaic law yet. And those promises to him and his seed were the results of his faith. And there's also, by the way, there's also no mention of those promises being annulled 
are canceled anywhere in the scriptures. Why would God cause the Apostle Paul to uh, reiterate that, reiterate the promise to Abraham, if at Calvary all the promises to Abraham's seed had been uh, annulled and done away with, and everything's promised to the Jew, or to the Gentile who believes in Christ. But he didn't. Um, then verse 18, back in our text, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Two immutable things. One, God's promise, mentioned in verse 17 again, and number two, God's oath, also mentioned in verse 17, which are almost synonyms with each other. But uh, as defined in verse 18, in which, those two words, in which it was impossible for God to lie. When God makes a promise, or he made an oath to anybody, that promise, that oath is going to be fulfilled, those promises are going to come to pass, and no one can change it. And you can't say, well, it's done away with just because you don't understand it, like a lot of uh, preachers do. It's, they have a technical term for it. It's called replacement theology, meaning that God has replaced the Jew and the promises to the Jews with uh, blessings to the church. All of the church inherits all of those things. This is mainly what the Roman Catholic Church believes that uh, God is no longer promising anything to the physical descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people, that all of the things, that all of those things have been replaced by Roman Catholicism and his, uh, the church of the Roman Catholic religion, uh, the popes, and the college of cardinals, and all the way down. But um, that can be, let me, in fact, I'm going to get off the main highway, I'm going to take you down to cul-de-sac, I want to show you a house down there, and then we're going to come back to the main road. <laughs> Go with, back to the, the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 20. We'll get back on the main road in just a minute, but I want to show you something in Matthew 20. <clears throat> Matthew 20, starting at verse 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. You know, in, um, in government structures, and even within Roman Catholicism, you have, uh, there's a chain of command, from the top down or from the bottom up. Uh, someone at the bottom is, is accountable or answerable to someone over him. And that person might be answerable to someone above them. And in Catholicism, it's the same thing with the Pope, and then the College of Cardinals, and then the Synod of Catholic Bishops throughout the world, and then under them, uh, local parish priests, uh, and so forth. And then under them, I suppose, church deacons, church uh, volunteers, and altar servers, and so forth. There's this chain of command, this hierarchical system. And it is with every government. By the way, do you know the only... The only, the single, only um, absolute monarchy that still exists in Europe is, guess what? Roman Catholic Church. The Pope is an emperor. And now uh, he's an emperor elected by the College of Cardinals, but he is an absolute ruler. There is no um, democracy, there is no vote among the people. Then Catholicism is an absolute. Uh, monarchy, where the popes reign as kings. In fact, the popes rule over kings in centuries past. But notice what the Lord Jesus says, Matthew 20, verse 25, they that are great exercise authority upon them. Verse 26, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. That text right there is one of the best anti-Vatican, anti-Roman Catholic texts in the entire Bible. That stands completely against the whole structure of Roman Catholicism from the Pope and the Vatican and the worldwide out, uh, uh, reach, global reach of every church, every parish throughout the world. That stands against it. 
because he said Christ came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And so it should be with his followers. And it shall not be so among you. None of the apostles uh, went out preaching the gospel, hoping to set themselves up as bishops over this country or bishop over that country or archbishop over other bishops and so forth. None of them set about to do that. But those who do, do so contrary to the instruction of Christ. Now back to our text. Let's turn our car around and get back on the main road here. And uh, that's defined for us, a good God's promises and God's oath, defined for us in verse 18, in which it was impossible for God to lie. Uh, Numbers 23, verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Yes, he will make it good. If he's made promise, he's going to fulfill it. And so that's why we believe that God has preserved the Jewish people because he still intends to fulfill his promises to them to grant them dominion over the world one day. Um, verse 18 says, The hope set before us. Again, there has to be a double application here. Let's read verses 19 and 20. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We talked about Melchizedek earlier, back in Hebrews chapter 5. He's rather an enigma in the scriptures. Not a lot is known about him. But he appeared and blessed Abraham long before there was ever a Le Levitical priesthood. Uh, one of the twelve tribes were set apart to be the priests among Israel. He blessed Abraham, and Abraham gave him uh, tithes or spoils of his war uh, to show his uh, worship of God uh, by proxy. And uh, Christ Jesus said to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Bible describes him saying having uh, neither a, a beginning or ending of days or descent. Nobody knew where he came from. Nobody knows what happened to him afterwards. But he appeared and blessed Abraham and Abraham gave him tithes as being God's representative on the scene at that point. And Jesus Christ, um, as a type of Christ, Jesus Christ was indeed God manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. But I like the language, you can make great spiritual application, uh, verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, uh, and which entered into that within the veil. Um, we sing that song, Will Your Anchor Hold in the Storms of Life? As drawn from this verse, uh, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Your salvation is steadfast, it's secure, it's solid, it cannot be destroyed, it cannot be taken away. Nothing you can do can undo it, because you didn't do the saving, God did the saving. Christ Jesus did the saving by washing you clean uh, by faith in his own blood. And so you do, Christ does the saving, therefore he has to be the one in charge of doing the keeping. He knows what he did, and he knows how to keep it in place. Whether you have great faith from day to day, you might be a saint and not live a saintly life. But that's uh, irrelevant. You're still a saint if you've trusted in Jesus Christ by faith. Uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 7 talks about the believers, Paul says, called to be saints. That's you, that's me. And so you and I are saints now, even if we're not living a saintly life all the time. But in our heart, the Holy Spirit convicts us and tells us when we mess up, when we do wrong, and shows us things from the Bible, brings Scripture to our memory, and tells you God's watching, and God's watching out for watching everything you do, and sees everything you do, and someday you're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and have to give account of that if you don't confess and get it right with God now. And so, um, do that. but, but um, nevertheless, uh, your hope ought to be set steadfast and sure and anchored in Jesus Christ. There's a great spiritual promise in that, and that Christ, our forerunner, according to verse 20, uh, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That is, 
the priests, the Levites, had to repeat the sacrifices every day. And uh, when someone sinned, and they knew they had sinned uh, in obedience to God, they were to bring an offering to the altar, to the Levites, and have that animal slain uh, on their behalf by the priest to cover that sin. And uh, that sin wasn't, uh, it was sort of like having a cancer in remission, that it's no longer active, and that something said to be in remission, Hebrews 9.22 Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sins. So that sin was remitted. It's not active anymore, but it's not fully erased from your record. And that's as far as the animals could benefit someone. You bring an animal, that sin is forgiven, it's remitted, but it's not removed. What you needed was a sacrifice that was greater than all the animals that would not only forgive your sin, but it would re remove your sin. So that from that point on, God sees only the perfection of His righteousness covering you. And that is, the, that is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, death on the cross of Calvary. He did what the animals were limited in doing. And so, but, but by faith, the Jew, or the hope of the believer, is uh, to receive a new body at the rapture before the tribulation takes place. Amen. I look i got time. Go back just for just a moment to the book of Romans, chapter 5. Romans 5, and let's start there at verse 1. Romans 5, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us also Romans 15, Romans 15, and uh, verse 4, Paul says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, meaning the Old Testament scriptures, were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. You know, without the Lord Jesus revealing himself to you, without the Bible, you'd have very little hope as a Christian. You'd just be floundering around, assuming you did the right thing somewhere along the way and expecting it to pay off one day, but no guidance whatsoever. No idea of what God wants you to do or what God has in store for you. You wouldn't know any of those things. But the more you read the Bible, the closer you're drawn to the person of the Lord Jesus, the, the closer you drawn to God himself. And um, God's able to speak to you. As I said in, earlier in church, it's a two-way conversation. You get to speak to God when you pray, and uh, God speaks to you when you read his word. I talk about prayer, and I meant to elaborate more in our Sunday uh, sermon. But there's some great books on how to pray, how to pray and get the answer, and so forth. And one guy wrote a book called Getting Things from God. I like that. It's a very direct title, Getting Things from God. It's all about prayer, but there's no way to learn how to pray except just to start praying. Just talk to God. You say, well, I don't know how to do that. Tell you what, just start doing it. You'll learn how to do it. Everything will fall into place, fall into line, and uh, you'll begin to know how to enter into the presence of God and talk to God. Be mindful of God all day long and uh, realize you can talk to Him at any time, day or night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, for the believer, his dead spirit is now made alive by being joined to the Holy Spirit. And... 
So prayer is no more difficult than saying, than just addressing God. Switch like that. I'm talking to you right now. I can be talking to God right now. God, you know exactly what these people need. That's prayer. It, it happens that quickly. You go right from one to the other. You don't have to say, well, should I recite this thing, this memorized text? Should I light a candle? Should I make sure there's some quiet music or no music at all? Should I wait a few minutes? No, no. you can talk to God just that fast. It's that instant. It's that immediate. It's that ever-present. Just start talking to him. And um, set aside time to do it. If you, the word tithe, will a man rob God? Malachi asks. God says, yet you have robbed me. And they say, we're in, in tithes and offerings. The tithe represented 10%. Guys, crops and his herds and his flocks. 10% of that he owed back to God. Be sacrificed to be given to the priests to support the work of the Levites and so on. If you tithe 10% of everything you have, it means that you owe God two hours and 40 minutes every day. Some people don't give God 30 seconds. You say, how do I become that kind of a disciple? Set your alarm clock, you doofus. <laughs> Go to bed earlier, get up earlier, before your, the cares of the day press in on you. No. You're a parent. Get up before your children wake up. Spend time talking to God. You say, well, how do I do that? What should I do? How much time? I don't know. Set your cell phone or the alarm clock for... Five minutes. Just start at five minutes. And see if you can not just go to prayer and just talk to God. Whatever comes to your mind about what you need, what you have, thank Him for what you've received, for blessings that have come to you in the past. And uh, your every individual family member, name them one by one. And pray for their needs. Pray for their welfare. Help you to be a, a good father, good mother to that young man or that young woman or what have you. And you'll see how quickly the alarm goes off. Yep. Just talk to him. Once you you'll be right in the middle of a thought that the the cell phone alarm will go off. You say, man, I, I could have talked to God longer. All right, well then you start setting it to seven minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes if you have to. You'll get to a point where you don't really need to use an alarm. You'll just know to talk to God. Pour your heart out to him. Discuss anything to him. Be his Casual with him, as uh, as you and I are to each other. Respectful, of course. And um, don't worry about saying the right words or using thee and thou. And so, I went to a Mormon church, and they have a poster on the wall about uh, talking to God. When you talk to the Heavenly Father, they say they don't say the Heavenly Father or our Heavenly Father. They say when you speak to Heavenly Father, because they believe we're all. Um, the offspring of God, God fathered each of us with one of his wives, and therefore you wouldn't say our dad when you're talking to your sister, you seem to say dad. And so in a similar way, they say heavenly father because they think they're all, they were all fathered um, physically by God and one of his wives. But they say when you talk to him, use biblical language, thee, thou, thine. You don't have to use biblical language all the time to talk to God. Sometimes it's, God, help! I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. I, I need money. I don't have money for this thing or that thing. I need medical help. I need someone to fix a family problem. And all of this thee and thou and prostrating yourself and laying down with your face. None of that. Talk to God uh, like the best friend you have who you know you can call upon and depend upon. Just start doing it. Those things will fall into place. You'll begin to grow spiritually like you never thought you could. But then the other promise, the other hope mentioned there as we finish out this chapter will be the hope of the Jews realized at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then 
they will be the supreme race of the world. God is not, um, God extended salvation to whosoever will. But the Bible says he uh, came unto his own, and his own received him not, the Jew. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So it was offered to the Jew first, because God has a special affection for the descendants of Abraham. And they're going to receive a land grant and a blessing from, it'll begin from the Nile River westward, uh, all the way over to the river Euphrates, eastward, that whole territory, which they've never possessed. Uh, I take that back. Solomon's reign extended that far, and part of King David's reign extended that far, once upon a time, but it didn't last for very long. And um, do you know that there were, the country of India is mentioned about three or four times in the book of Esther. People of the ancient world knew about other parts of the ancient world. The kingdoms of India, uh, India knew about the land of Palestine in their day. They knew about the wisdom of Solomon. They knew about the kingdom of Solomon, the queen of the east, came to visit Solomon to see his splendor and uh, test him with hard questions, the Bible says. And when she saw the, the, the ascent by the servants and the, the going in and out of the temple and the cupbearers and all of the splendor, the Bible says there was no more spirit left in her. She was overwhelmed. There were people of the ancient world knew about each other, but that, king, that land grant given by God to Abraham has never been fully realized by them. But it's going to be. And the rest of the world, by extension, I had a guy uh, text me with some interesting questions earlier this week, and I said, what about this? If God divided the 12 tribes of Israel according, to, and he used different gemstones in the, in the high priest's breastplate to do it, 12 gemstones, one representing each of the 12 tribes, <clears throat> if you did a study on where each of those gemstones are primarily mined throughout the world, you might have an idea of where there'll be a concentration of Jews living one day during the thousand year reign. I'm, I'm just speculating, but the Bible provokes all kinds of great questions, prompts your thinking in a number of ways. 